I'm gonna say it again. Because I'm living proof that they work. Get your energy back, sleep better, and block out the unhealthy effects of blue light with Blue Blocks glasses. Get free shipping worldwide and 15% off by going to blueblocks.com slash stoner or enter code stoner at checkout. That's B-L-U-B-L-O-X dot com slash stoner for 15% off or just use the code stoner. And you can check me out in my yellow linens on my Instagram. Looking for CBD products that are scientifically proven, 100% organic, safely manufactured, and help you feel better without needing to feel high? Look no further. Try Ned. Go to www.helloned.com slash stoner or enter code stoner at checkout for 15% off your first order plus free shipping. That's H-E-L-L-O-N-E-D dot com slash stoner or code stoner to get 15% off your first order plus free shipping. Hey everyone, welcome to Simplexity, where we simplify the complexities of life and bring a little curiosity and contemplation to meaningful and sometimes difficult conversations. I'm your host, Allison Stoner, and today we are still in quarantine. I have a different audio configuration, so I really appreciate your generosity and graciousness in listening, even though I'm not on my yummy Aston microphone. So let's get into it. By broad definition and usage, technology is credited for representing the invention of tools and techniques and the turning points and advancements that affect our environment and reconfigure social, political, and economic activity from modern day all the way back to medieval, ancient, and even prehistoric ages. But you know what helped set the stage right at Act One for our earliest ancestors to embark on this earthly experience? Culture, the behaviors, norms, and values fashioned in the first societies, which obviously swayed what and how technology emerged. Yes, even Stone Age cultures established particular music, cave paintings, and terms for engaging in organized warfare. Before the advent of modern technology, cultures generally developed independently in isolation from others. But now we're intertwined in ways even our recent elders couldn't even begin to fathom. We've grown, diversified, converged, and subdued thousands of cultures and subcultures, adding layers and complexity to our personal cultural signatures. For example, we may participate in American culture and hip-hop culture, Buddhist and Boomer. The combinations and subdivisions are endless. This interconnectedness is spurred by innovation, which aims to satisfy the planet's and civilization's evolving needs and whims while provoking its own thirst for further progress. In 2020, we're meeting potential soulmates on dating apps, getting groceries delivered with the touch of a button, and sharing photos on social media with complete strangers. <laughs> but. As the speed of digitalization increases, so do the disparities already prevalent across ecosystems, giving greater urgency to the democratization of technology, data, resources, and market power. For years, we've fawned over startup meccas like Silicon Valley, where techies and entrepreneurs churn out new devices, apps, and programs. While they claim to develop for the masses, each piece of technology is impelled by millions of minute choices, egoic preferences, logistical pressure points in the development phase, not to mention the inevitable straight-up ignorance of its imperfect creators, stakeholders, board of advisors, and supply chain. These fragments of data are further contextualized by every team member's amalgam of personal identifiers like politics, morality, anatomy, upbringing, and maybe even more simply, their mood on the day that fateful decision was made. All these conscious and unconscious choices and the strategies from individuals, groups, and organizations backing them are subliminally encoded into the software and hardware, and that technology exerts its unique influence on our society and culture. Woeful prejudices are as common an ingredient as luminous genius, leading to cultures and societies whose cancers are hiding in plain sight. How does this apply to your culture? 
Look, it'd be easy and convenient to view technology as inanimate, agnostic, and detached from the human touch, to disregard its robust global historiography. But technology has always had an affair with society and culture. They inseparably fold into and flirt with and reinforce one another. Don't be fooled, though, by the narrow accounts we get of their romance. Many textbooks center Western Europe and North America as the main actors in technology's development, focusing on stories of printing, steam engines, and nuclear power. Promoting only one geographic area's achievements will offer, at best, an incredibly neglectful, limited, and bland scope, and at worst, horrifying casualties and heinous inequity. Pretending the latter doesn't exist is something today's guest doesn't have time for, because there are universal algorithms, languages, and realities to construct and disseminate as our species inches toward quantum, intergalactic, and dare I say, infinite expansion of consciousness and intelligence. Idris Sandu was born in Ghana and raised in Compton and Harbor City, where his curiosity led him to tinker with devices and gadgets at an early age, breaking apart phones, remotes, you name it, examining their guts, then performing surgery, aka reprogramming them for new or improved functions. By 15, he created an app that helped fellow students at his school find their classrooms, drawing inspiration from Steve Jobs' revolutionary presentation of the iPhone and in the humanitarian work of Ghanaian diplomat and Nobel Peace Prize laureate Kofi Annan. Idris soon received a certificate of recognition from President Obama and then proceeded to decline higher education at MIT twice because the validation from external forces wasn't worth delaying the opportunity for immediate impact in his community. Instead, he built critical tech for Google, Uber, Instagram, Boeing, Twitter, Snapchat, Facebook, and beyond. He's widely documented for architecting the world's first smart store with late rapper activist entrepreneur Nipsey Hussle, rest in power. Today, Idris is the founder and owner of Spatial Labs, Ethos DNA, and Halt, as well as a music video director, musician, and edutainer. That is, he makes education entertaining and cool. Helping him achieve that is the fact that he's immersed in and relevant to the culture. He has his finger on the pulse to know what people want and need while not getting stuck in the addictive rush of the digital platforms themselves. This allows him to reflect, observe, and then architect consciously while eliminating his own excuses. What if instead of being a pawn on the chessboard or even striving to become the king or queen, we became the game makers, crafting the board and designing the rules ourselves? To tap into this frequency, we're going to explore his career, personal philosophy, hacks from programming, engineering, and design that we can apply to our own lives, predictions for the future, and how that informs self and public education. And then, Let's figure out how we can ditch the excuses that are holding us back. Don't worry, you will fall down the best rabbit hole after this. Idris, welcome to Simplexity. Thank you so much for having me in such a introduction. I thoroughly enjoyed every single like line in that and I'm so grateful to be here on this platform, which I think is super amazing. So mm. thank you for having me. Honor and pleasure are all mine. So let's be honest, not every one of us is inter interested in being a prototypical computer programmer or technological architect, yet there are frameworks embedded in every field that can shape how we approach our own daily processes, our habits, and perspectives of our own cognition and the nature of the universe. There are thousands of technical terms and dozens of programming languages that we won't cover all in this episode, but I'm wondering how can we drive to the center of tech by way of hip hop? You've had some great analogies that help explain computer programming in this way. How can hip hop help us understand technology and operating systems. I'm so glad that you brought that question up. And I think one thing that people, because of the scope in which hip hop has been represented in the past and the linear way that it's been articulated, people haven't really seen the deepness of what hip hop in itself has represented. And you can liken hip hop to the equivalent of its own startup. 
hip hop is a startup that's forever evolving. You think about people like Grandmaster Flash, Africa Bombada, DJ Cool Herc, and more specifically Grandmaster Flash, taking an already existing product, the turntables, and finding something which you would call the breakdown and looping those and then making a beat out of an already existing product. That's what startups do all day. Very few companies are creating something that hasn't been created before. A lot of companies are taking already existing products, optimizing them, scaling them, and making more dynamic and serving it to hundreds, if not thousands of millions of people. And that's the same way that hip hop is scaled. But it doesn't get the same recognition or the same light as all these other ones, obviously, like companies coming from Silicon Valley and other parts of the world, because we haven't built that design language of reference. So when I was younger, I used to be very influenced by Bauhaus house design. Now Bauhaus, for those of you that might be tuning in that might have never heard of it, Bauhaus was basically a collection. It was a conglomerate of universal design principles that was created around 1918 to 1919, originating from Germany. And the goal of Bauhaus was to unite all designers to have one universal principle so that they can reference when they were creating to create some of the best technologies, right? So you think about shapes, fonts, colors being very essential to the Bauhaus movement. Hip hop doesn't have that equivalency. There is no universal design language. There is no universal design language that applies to fonts to be used when you're in a studio writing your notes, how you should proportion out your album covers or proportion out your sonics or whatever it might be. And in that right, some might say, well, because hip hop is built on creativity, which I completely agree. You find creativity in itself, but you can't have creativity from chaos, right? When you have a very principled guide on how to utilize things, that's where things change. So who was there when, you know, Grandmaster Flash or DJ Kohork or Africa Bambata was creating these parties and inviting 50, well, now that Corona's happened, it's <laughs> insane to imagine 50 people in a room, right, and jamming out to music. but who was there to say at these concerts this would be the types of clothing people would wear to come here these would be the color variation that the disco ball was da, da, da. so if you wanted to recreate the similar experience here's a color palette here's the design language here's the vibe here's the this right and i think that's what it's it's lacked in there hasn't been enough representation in the same way that we would talk about, you know, minimalism, essentialism, Bauhaus, brutalism, and all these different isms, one, put you in a box, but they've been very well documented. You go to DC and you see heavy brutalist architecture, very stone carvings, very straight, poignant shapes, right? You think of neo-futurism, where a lot of brands are adapting now, which talks about the morphing of things and connecting back on a very organic level. Technology should feel very organic. It should be round. It should be curved, just like nature, biomimicry. But hip hop in itself has a very, very, very interesting place because it's not necessarily a principle and it's not necessarily just something that you acquire. It's not a trend or just a culture. It's a way of life. Hip hop right. is a way of life. So the more that we start understanding what hip hop fully is and how we can essentially create these same colloquialisms that we would do with programming language, algorithms, binary, you know, ints, booleans, parameters, variables, all these technologies that we use in a programming language, if we could create those same colloquialisms and words and dictions and things around hip hop, we will greatly truly see it for what it has already done, more importantly, and the future of it. We will start seeing that it's not that there's been a lack of innovation, it's that the innovation has not been documented. Hmm. And talking about innovation without documentation, especially in this era, is quite pointless, right? Because exposure is the new, what? Education? education. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. There you go. And the reason why, how I even came across this terminology is I was realizing education was amazing for the dawn of the last century, right? Where information was limited. And it was such a rarity that only a select few could guide you to the right information and you can scale from there. But now information is abundant. Therefore, its value is even increased, but the quality of it has been greatly diminished and the quantity of it is out there, right? Mm -hmm. So we live in an era now where an educator can become uneducated. And more importantly, the moment an educator becomes uneducated, you are limited by that. Someone said something to me about two years ago that stuck with me to this day. And the person told me that the person who controls the diameter of your thinking controls the circumference of your knowledge, mm. right? And that's what education is. The diameter of what you're 
access to and what you're told to be right and what the end all be all is limits the circumference of what you think is out there. Being in class and going to a public school and my teacher telling me about all the elements that we have and making hydrogen, helium, lithium, beryllium, boron, carbon, nitrogen, oxygen, memorizing all of these elements and then ending it and saying, and the last one is, that's education. Exposure mm. is, and this is the last one we've discovered. Mm. This is where we currently are. This right. is the present, right? But to say the last one is, is to impose that there is no future. We cut that off. So that's the difference between education and exposure. It's about not only teaching people how to go to the lake and how to fish, but giving them the tools to fish on their own, giving them the tools to be able to create their own boat and their image and float on the seas in the way that they see fit. If we were to draw on additional analogies, the same way that a piece of technology and a device has an input and output, we have our own mental models. And if we see our mental models as finite, then we will only have a finite number of functions. We'll come to expect a finite number of behaviors from ourselves. Whereas if we do create you know, a phrase that has an ellipsis at the end, dot, 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 to be continued. It opens us up to ways that we can grow. And then, of course, whatever we create will be able to reflect that expansiveness as well. You mentioned something very important, which is the notion that when we apply finite parameters on us or our technologies, or we applied finite variables or parameters on us, our technologies will be limited by those finite variables, right? So by that, I mean, you mentioned something really important, which I think it's so important for us to address. And that's when you started the introduction, you talked about quantum, right? The quantum realm. In classical computing, there is a bit, right? And that bit can store one of two values, a zero or a one state. So it's black and white. It's night and day. It's zero or one. And zero would be an off state, one would be an on state. And you gather eight bits together, each carrying its own signal, and you form like a word, you know, and a lot of words have eight bits and eight bits equals one byte and so on and so forth. But the interesting thing is in the quantum space, you learn about superpositioning which is the ability for a bit essentially or an atom to be a one zero and everything else in between all at the same time. And I always found that interesting because I think as we create technology, we need to understand that for every positive signal, there's equally a negative signal in the quantum space. Technology only has positives. And growing up, that's all we learned, that there's only positives of technology. And then it wasn't until we saw all these things that we realized that for every positive, there's a negative. You take two atoms and you drag them to the end of the universe. When one of them reacts, the other reacts. And from a very metaphoric standpoint, one might react in a positive effect and the inverse might be shown in a negative respect to the other side. Not literal, but from a metaphoric standpoint. So I think it's so important that we realize that in this conversation as we're creating, there is the inverse of a conversation like this happening somewhere else in a different capacity. And that in itself, and that submission to that in itself will allow us to create some of the best technologies and put us in the right space if we really understood that. Yes, and you brought up several things things there, the concept of switching from either or to both and thinking, which on a very introductory level helps us to even understand the contradictions within our own personalities. And instead of trying to choose between one career or another, one title and label or another, recognizing that we have the capacity and propensity to be both. That includes being the hater and the lover. You also use the term understand instead of understand. And, and that concept of going inward in order to go upward is something that we talk about often here. In fact, the both and theme was just used. I wrote a commencement speech and the entire concept for young people was you're entering a time when there is a moment of global reckoning and we're all being asked to take inventory and be more accountable for our own actions as well as our systems and, and the planet. And it would be nice to just celebrate this as a beautiful achievement. However, you're entering the both and realm. Mm -hmm. This is both a day to celebrate and a time to check in. <laughs> Welcome to adulthood. <laughs> and when I was younger, it's interesting because one thing that I noticed about programming languages as I, as I you know, was learning, because I was learning low level things. And in tech, when you use low, you're actually talking about high. And when you mean high, you're actually talking about low. So low level means you're trying to get into the kernel, the operating system, the, the machine code. High level is APIs, you know, application programming interfaces. I'm tapping into the high end. And one thing that I noticed in very, a lot of popular languages, uh, for example, Java and C Sharp, 
these two languages, or even C, there's something called operators, right? And operators are essentially those mathematical, you would see the greater sign, less than, equal sign, or whatever. Mm -hmm. But one thing that I found interesting when I was a kid and I was programming is that when I wanted exact value of something, I would have to have the equivalent of the analogy of the quantum state of both, right? So if I wanted to check for one value and another value, I wouldn't just type one end, I would type two and and if I wanted to compare two values together, or if I wanted to even say or, or is represented as two lines, right? There are two lines up like this, perpendicularly looking at each other. So it's very interesting how even based on our own language, we're limited by the finite ability of what we think language is and how that biasness can even follow us as we create programming languages. You've said this can be called diction bias, correct? Diction bias. And I, um, I'll be speaking with another wonderful person shortly, and we're going to get into ML fairness in institutions and how the concept of fairness is even different across cultures. How you define fair is not how I define fair. So let's carry on here. You studied microeconomics and macroeconomics at a young age. And you've blended that information with your technical prowess and your knowledge of how design, engineering, and culture influence consumer behavior and therefore the success of a product or movement. For example, for those who are unaware, with the Marathon Store, you and Nipsey were examining problems that existed for both artists and retailers. Many artists, for those of you who are unaware, have issues owning and protecting their IP due to label contracts, mass copyright infringement, etc. And they're unable to scale their brands and missions in a profitable and meaningful way, circling back to what I just was referring to with uh, hip hop as a way of life and a startup. Then as Donna Berry wrote recently for Food Business News, retailers are facing extreme disruption as millennials, urbanization, digitalization, and this Amazon era grab a bigger share of sales. However, physical retail isn't dying, bad retail is. And there's a need for brick and mortars to offer extreme value, extreme convenience, and an extreme experience that customers can't get online in order to stay alive. With these factors in mind, you and Nipsey found a solution by creating the world's first smart store, an immersive experience where Customers can purchase merch and use an app to preview exclusive content. You used technological tools like geofencing, which means creating a virtual boundary around a specific location where people can access that content. And also it super serves Nipsey's core fan base and an experience that's just curated purely for them. So between the current pandemic and your observations of the economy and millennial and Gen Z behavior, what are the biggest problems you foresee businesses facing as they try to stay afloat? And what principles will be most helpful in adapting to the changing environments and future reality? To my knowledge, and I very much consider myself a philosopher over anything. I had tweeted earlier today that use my experiences and my success as a guide, but never your North Star. You know, learn from the successes and improve on the failures. And so whatever I'm about to say is, again, it's a perspective. And I think one of the most interesting things about retail is like you just said in itself, it's not that retail is dying, it's that bad retail is dying. And more importantly, brands have not fully encompassed and understood the duality of not only physical adaptability, but digital adaptability. Hmm. A lot of brands only physically adapt. By that I mean stores are thinking about, hey, let's redesign our store. Mm -hmm. But when it comes to the digital experience, at most, the only thing about redoing our website. They don't think about how we can, the same way that we would think about the different creative ways to engage our physical store, let's think about that on a very digital way. And so what I see is a lot of brands will either survive through this or diminish through this period due to the way that they are physically not just able, but willing to digitally adapt. Because the era that we live in now, you don't have to be the creator to adapt. You can also utilize from the perspective of a, of a user. There's so many platforms that will emerge in the AR space, VR space, MR space, 
which will give you an opportunity as a brand to grow. Another huge veal that has been put over entrepreneurs, especially in the retail space, is that the way for them to engage with their customers has to be linear. They're equivalent of their Mecca, that Kaaba, that you know Muslims go around to worship has to be their retail store. That's what people think. So you see brands like Supreme and, and so many that make people line up all around the block and everything and wait. That's great, but it's very limiting. Mm -hmm. And it conditions your consumer into thinking that your brand is strong in that skill set, which is great when it works. But what happens when it doesn't work? Mm -hmm. Nobody's lining on Supreme right now. Nobody's right. lining on Fairfax right now. In fact, the streets are all deserted. So it's great when it works, but when it doesn't work, what's your fail safe? So I think we're going to start seeing a lot of brands either adapting, digitally evolving, digitally adapting, or physically diminishing. I mean, it's already happening, right? And some companies realize that on early on. They might not have figured out the full puzzle, but brands like Nike and Adidas closed a lot of their retail stores before any of this stuff happened because they realized that the future is digital. The future is online. And I think with the word online, majority of us that grew up on the World Wide Web, because I'm 23, I remember a time before Wi-Fi was mainstream. I remember before YouTube was what it was. I remember going to Borders to read. But I, it came just at the right time to understand the analog, you know, pager, but to understand the representation of what the new pager is, which is your notification bar on your phone, right? Mm -hmm. At every app, every second, giving you a notification, mm -hmm. the same way that a pager would. In that capacity, I think a lot of us that grew up on the World Wide Web, when we hear digital, the first thing we think about is websites. But digital is any Anything that is a representation or a simulation or an alternative to the physical. So you can create digital stores, you can create digital inventory, you can create digital incentives. And for majority of us in this space, the most wide known association or classification of the digital web is a term called gamification. And that's what a lot of brands are adapting now and learning from. The digital experience is not just about my website, but it's about this terminology or this term called gamification, which is based on incentivizing and borrowing elements of video games and incorporating them into your retail, incorporating them into the user experience and understanding that they're not meant to be separate. They're meant to be fused as one. Right. And that'll also support the business in having higher retention, a sense of perceived value as the user of that product. And of course, the addiction side of <laughs> gamifying anything if you leave everything unmonitored. Some other things that came to mind were the fact that maybe in the last few decades or so, and this is a very limited perspective and generalization, but we've allowed industries to become very siloed. And we're wanting everyone to have this specialization in one particular skill, yet the new era is asking for us to cross sectors and collaborate. That's a hard thing to do if you're not used to applying yourself in that way. And just like you're speaking to brands, this also can be stripped back to an individual level. We are having to ask ourselves, are we willing to adapt or fall off? And it's very uncomfortable for many people who have tasted success already previously. That can lead to a sense of just being so easily satisfied with your last accomplishment that you're dulled into thinking you have to change. And the truth of the matter is right now, yes, the new normal depends on each of us going through our own metamorphosis and being willing to do so. If that means, you know, the business that you wanted to create originally, maybe you revisit that plan and you consider how the digital realm can play into that strategic plan now. Your dreams to market your music, instead of just trying to secure that one billboard on Sunset and Vine, now it's time to think of what your digital billboards look like. I don't talk about selfies often because I don't take selfies outside of work. However, I just posted a you-know-what wearing my yellow linen blue blocks glasses, and I had a lot of DMs asking where they were from. Most people loved the style and didn't realize I'm also wearing them to combat digital eye strain and reduce my anxiety via color therapy and fix the blurred vision and headaches I started getting around week five-ish of this. <laughs> so Blue Blocks has over 40 hip frames that come in prescription, non-prescription, and readers. And for each pair of Blue Blocks glasses purchased, they donate a pair of reading glasses to someone in need. So do yourself a favor, get your energy back, sleep better, and block out the unhealthy effects of blue light with Blue Blocks. Get free shipping worldwide and 15% off by going to blueblocks.com stoner or enter code stoner at checkout. That's B-L-U-B-L-U-B-L-U-B-L-U-B-L-U-B-L-U-B-L-U-B-L-U-B-L-U-B-L-U-B-L-U-B-L-U-B-L-
B-L-O-X.com slash stoner for 15% off or just use the code stoner. CBD is the new ABC, meaning it's becoming a fundamental element in the wellness cabinet. And for a leading company like Ned, the THC levels are low enough, so no, the products don't make you high. But yes, they can regulate nearly every biological system in your body. Ned is a leading company that offers high-quality, 100% organic CBD in the form of wonderful salves, tinctures, roll-ons, body butter, lip balm. They even infuse essential oils into certain blends and they leave you smelling like fresh flowers and love. So don't just take it from me. Help your body and mind help themselves and get a little TLC, a little relief in this stressful time. Go to www.helloned.com stoner or enter the code STONER at checkout for 15% off your first order plus free shipping. That's H-E-L-L-O-N-E-D dot com slash STONER or code STONER to get 15% off your first order plus free shipping. So, all right, let's switch into your career and more of your personal philosophy. You've worked with the world's largest corporations as a minor and young adult. And to many people, it's a lifelong aspiration to be employed by the likes of Google or a patron of top luxury brands like Prada. We are easily enamored by the very institutions who create and dominate our perceptions of value, beauty, success, and what is attainable for us in life. However, a peek inside the infrastructure of those institutions reveals that they're fueled and fortified by hiring and leveraging the everyday passionate innovators, the most equipped minds, the high demand technicians who invest all their energy and ideas into developing and ballooning the company's market share while sacrificing ownership, profit, and scalable influence. Employees wear the high profile names as badges of honor on their resume as if that's the justifiable compensation when it only further cements the current power dynamics. So as a response, You've shared that a main concept driving your career path is vertical integration. What is vertical integration and how could it transform a marginalized community or a pocket of culture like hip hop? That's a very, very great question. And I think the reason I wasn't always like that, vertical integration wasn't something that I ultimately always thought about. Mm. But it stemmed from realizing and acknowledging the problems that existed in the tech community. One thing you had referenced earlier is this notion of addiction bias, right? And more importantly, I think the ability for us to think that the end all be all is the equivalent of that badge on our shirt rather than how we can optimize and create our own minds. We're fighting for opinions majority of the time. Mm. We're not fighting or we're not given the opportunity to actually bring about infrastructural change. Mm -hmm. Right. So we're talking about tweaking the app instead of tweaking the operating system. Right. Mm -hmm. So we often fall in this talking about problem based thinking from the perspective of a consumer rather than a solution oriented thinking of creation from a creator. Right. Mm -hmm. And that's something that I noticed early on. And so I studied how the best companies did it. I studied Steve Jobs very, very closely. And when I was a kid, literally a minor, watching the first iPhone come out, you know, you could see some people like their computers in a video. You could see some people on their then Blackberries blogging about it. I noticed something that he said around, I think it was around seven to eight marks in. And before, you know, he even went into the full product, he said, Alan Kay said to build your own software and make your own hardware and vice versa. If you're serious about creating hardware, make your own software. If you're serious about creating software, make your own hardware. And that would set the precedent for every single thing that Apple would create. Mm. And I noticed as I grew up, as I evolved, as new products were launched, the iPhone would go on to create an ecosystem called iOS, where they would distribute their apps through the Apple Store. The Apple Watch would go on to have an operating system called Watch OS, which would have its own separate store. The Mac computer would go on to have its own operating system called the Mac OS, and Mac OS would have its own operating system. Their own voice assistant, their own operating system for a watch. Even their TV runs its own operating system called TVOS. Hmm. And for a while I was like, hmm, maybe this is just a coincidental discovery. And then a year after the iPhone launched, 
Google launched something called Android. Throughout my evolution of growing up, I would notice the same exact thing. There was Android Mobile. There was Android Wear for the watches. There was Android TV. And now there's even Android Auto for the vehicles. Each of those things had its own app store and way of connecting consumers together through a, a central system for buying and selling. And so what I realized was that these companies, even if it might not have been physically, like Apple does physical and digital, but majority of these companies vertically integrated their businesses digitally. Apple went from building scraps and building the first Apple first computer with Steve and Woz to building their own operating system and now controlling pretty much everything that they create. And the importance of this, and Apple should be the best case study for companies to look at this, because other companies that I respect, like IBM and Oracle, have in their own right done at least variations of this. Apple is the best case study to do this because the number one reason why Apple is one of the most popular brands and one of the most trusted brands through replacing the connectors and taking everything out and people still trust them is because Apple understood that vertical integration was an essential part of quality control. Mm. When you open source something too early, yeah, it's great for the community, but there's no quality control. So QR, when it first came out, was a very, very amazing and very important innovation. But the problem was there was no quality control. It was open source. Anybody can make a QR code. And because any brand that just started from yesterday, all the way to large scale brands could create it, by the time the big companies were ready to do things on a scale, the smaller companies that made 100 pairs of t-shirts with QR codes on them had messed it up for the larger brands. Mm -hmm. So on the topic of vertical integration, vertical integration is a form of business in which you control two or more supply chains internally within your company. I have simplified that and I simply say vertical integration is a form of business in which you attempt or you do your best to control the whole life cycle of your product. And I say life cycle because a part of a vertical integration in itself is the ending life cycle of you killing off your own product. Mm -hmm. And that's what Apple did with the iPod. The iPod was killed off when it was one of the most successful devices. And Apple understood that we need to vertically integrate and destroy our product and transform it before somebody else does. Mm -hmm. And so that's been an essential part, but I really didn't start applying vertical integration until I met Nipsey Hussle. And he was also aligned on that. He wanted to vertically integrate his music, his art, his album covers, everything. And we talked about Nikolai Kardashev. And Nikolai Kardashev was a Soviet astrophysicist astronomer. And he came up with this thing called the Kardashev scale. And quite simply, the Kardashev scale is basically a scale in which he created at that time to measure a civilization's advancements. Now, the civilization's advancements wasn't necessarily directed at the innovation that they create. It wasn't dictated on their population. It wasn't dictated on their knowledge. It was based on how or if that civilization was able to harness the full power of its own immediate solar system or its own energy force was specifically what he noted. You know, for the sake of this conversation, I'm just going to mention three of those stages. There was a mm -hmm. stage one, a type one civilization, stage two, a type two civilization, and a stage three or a type three civilization. The first type one civilization talked about a civilization being advanced when it was able to harness the power of its own sun. The second, its own galaxy, and the third, its whole universe. And on that scale, he noted that at that time, and even still now, <laughs> we weren't even a type one civilization. We mm -hmm. harnessed less than 10% of our sun. Elon himself is like, we have this huge nuclear reactor, nuclear fusion system in the air. It's just there. And we haven't fully tapped into it. So with that being said, vertical integration for me was integral for me to understand the way that we push forward these dialogues and the way that we ultimately instill this sense of universality of technology digitally and physically is by being on the side of quality control, right? right? And quality control of quality, right? Quality control control, not quantity control, which a lot of companies fall into. Oh, we're making a lot, we're pushing a lot of units. If you, if you look at the market share, Microsoft still dominates in the PC space and Apple isn't as much, but it's the quality of the projects. It's the quality of the user experience, the user interface, how people feel, the empathy attached to products that make things different. So that's not only vertical integration, but how I chose and how I got to this stage of understanding that to make true impact, I would need to vertically integrate my software and hardware and all the things that I create and everything else in between. Right, because you look at places like Africa, whose materials and resources are abundant, and yet they're being extracted and stolen and used in all of the devices we're using every day, but they get no credit and they have no ownership. And the same thing with something like hip hop, where you can actually have the ability to not just be a culture that is 
you know, high in consumption but low in production, you can actually invert that and make sure that it's going back into the neighborhoods. It's being reinvested into the people who created the culture. And of course, we see that in the forms of, you know, appropriation and theft in so many ways that the systems are out of whack and could be less whack, to put it lightly. We're pushing toward rapid innovation and we have to meet these market demands, but there are definitely people who are not being recognized along the way. And that gives a greater emphasis on the need for empathy in our ideas and in our approach. I want to jump to public education and self-education and how to further democratize technology. You, even in this conversation alone, exhibit (laughs) tremendous transparency and willingness to transfer information publicly which cues fear in many of your supporters who worry for your safety if certain powers that be uh, see you as too great a threat or free agent changing the fabric, refitting the conventions of society. However, you've expressed that information shared is already outdated, implying even the most cutting edge tools, especially if they're already commercially available, are already depreciating and will eventually expire as we rapidly advance. This places us in a bit of an information race where those who are ever curious, those who are lifelong learners, who are constantly self-educating, may be at a natural advantage, yet absorbing tons of information without knowing how to synthesize concepts and apply them to daily challenges leaves us with encyclopedic knowledge versus systematic knowledge. Furthermore, without a clear personal vision or sense of purpose, it can be hard to discern what field or topic or person to study and and which should be the priority. So as we proceed into an automated future where man and machine are, you know, in many ways conjoined and ideally symbiotic and where job markets and living conditions inevitably evolve to reflect these changes, there's wisdom in having enough foresight to hold up our own personal dreams and goals and skills to the unique variables in our global reality in order to find the best opportunities that align with our potential. And for example, I could dream of selling kirtles, which is a fashion garment worn centuries ago, but that might be more of a niche market than an essential business in 2020. And Idris, you've said you can wait for your purpose to come to you, or you can teach yourself what that purpose should be. So with automation and the quantum age in mind, what key subjects concepts and global conditions do you recommend we inform ourselves about as we set our personal goals? You know, answering that question requires a little bit of context in the fact that by far, to our knowledge, the human body is one of the most meticulously curated pieces of technology on planet Earth. In our race to even replicate even parts of the human body, we've spent billions, if not trillions of dollars just creating one or two components that are part of the larger piece of the puzzle that are part of the larger piece of the puzzle that are part of the full picture. Yeah. And in that capacity, this is the most perfect representation of technology that we have around us, the human body, period, Mm -hmm. around us from an organic material known to Earth. I believe there's other civilizations somewhere out there, but we don't know them yet, right? So based on what we know, we are the most meticulously curated and perfect forms of technology around us. So everything since the age of time has been built around enhancing or optimizing the way in which we use our body. You look at the Stone Age, you think about tools. It's about using these bodies. It's not about the tool. It's about us using our hands to enhance that. So in that capacity, it's very, very interesting when you talk about what philosophies are needed. And I think one of the main philosophies is understanding the preciousness of the human body Mm. and how we can study the body and understand that we will never get to the perspective of optimization of the body in itself, but we can build with the body in mind instead of focusing on replacing we need to create sort of the singularity, but not from the perspective of what people think it is, you know, human beings fusing with the machines, but human beings coexisting with the technology that they built, but mm-hmm. understanding that the human is always superior to the technology that is built because it's inherently flawed. 
you can ask any scientist, astrophysicist, technologist, engineer, what is the probability of us receiving or entering quantum supremacy or even nanoparticle efficiency, the efficiency of the way that our body works. Mm -hmm. If we were to even make a, a neural network the size of, or a neural network system the size of an ant, it will take us several servers only to realize that, that all those algorithms can only approximate how the ant should behave. Not what it should eat, not what it anticipates for the future, how ants gather food for the future. Those right. things are literally in the source code of the ant. In, in a human technology way, we would call that source code, we would call that the DNA, right? DNA of the ant, the source code of the machine. And the interesting thing about the question is that I feel that the answer is in us really looking at ourselves, hmm. really understanding the perfection and the divinity that's within us in itself that we really build things around aspiration versus necessity. In fact, majority of companies that exist today, if we were to do a tally, we would realize that we have about a one to 10,000 ratio of companies that are needed versus companies that are wanted. So you have some of the brightest minds that go to school and go to colleges and have the solutions to curing cancer and have the solutions or at least the, the ideas around designing more efficient, cheaper EpiPens. Mm -hmm. But the largest corporations go find these individuals and promise them all these other things and say, come work for us and design for the 1%. Take that level of design thinking that is needed to restore order in the world and use it to be the very threading needle that causes the chaos and the limitation of this. And to that I say, nature is the greatest creative director. Whether you're religious or not, you know, nature, let's use nature. It's perfect, it's great at optimization. Nature takes a long time to do these things. Who said anything about time? We only at most live for a hundred years. We blow up this planet, we think that's the end of the planet. It will form back, mm -hmm. it'll take time, which we don't have. And by default, we're taught that when we don't understand things, that they're wrong. You know, to answer your question, I think that's one of the most important things that young entrepreneurs at the dawn of a new millennium, at the dawn of a new era, need to have. And everything I just said was to say that empathy is the core that weaves everything together. Empathy is the threading needle that weaves all forms of design, all forms of creation, all forms of optimization, and all forms mm -hmm. of scalability together. We learn about people in the past that people like Gandhi, people like Jesus, people like Muhammad, that weren't rich in any way, but they were able to spread messages that far suppressed, suppressed the life. So therefore, empathy isn't based on physical resources. When we learn about people that have optimized things and optimized recipes, people like Dr. Sebi that talked about, you know, sea moss and all these different things and at his age was able to bend down on his knees, you know. So therefore, we know that scalability isn't based off of physical strength. There's so many things that we can notice within our societies and the basic intricacies of life that can help us build some of the best companies that we've ever seen, some of the greatest empires ever seen. So Rather than talk about a lot of different things that can be woven or people, skill sets or ways of thinking that young people, anybody you know, at the dawn of a new millennium should understand the most important thing is empathy. If tech companies created from the perspective of empathy rather than biasness, we would not be here. But then again, we wouldn't be having this podcast right now, <laughs> you know, if that were the case. But it just shows that if you ask that question, when you created this, were you creating this for everybody or were you creating it for everyone else? And by default, a company that does not have a diverse team from the ground up or aims to have a diverse team automatically has to submit to the will of biasness. Mm -hmm. When you don't have a diverse team around you, you're going to be inherently biased. Mm -hmm. And that's okay because we're human. But when you choose to be drowning in that ignorance of knowing that you're going to be limited and biased, and even if you didn't care about humanity and wanted to only think about your business, you're limiting, you're yielding profit by only thinking a linear way. So I think by far to this day, until the day where something comes up, then I might change my answer. And what COVID has done has really balanced out the equation. It doesn't care if you're skinny, if you're whatever, you know, it doesn't care what gender you are, you identify with. It doesn't care how rich you are, how poor you are. Anybody can be affected. Mm -hmm. And I think this was in a very bittersweet way, the natural decree that had to come for us to really realize that we need to submit to the will of empathy. So now businesses have to incorporate empathy, whether they like it or not. Nobody's going to come to your retail store if you're the only person that is like, we don't care about masks. You just come in here and buy your products and leave. We want your money. People are not going to want to go in there because they're now risking their own health. So this period, we're going to see some of the most greatest companies, once they acknowledge empathy, 
once they understood that of all the things that Steve Jobs had talked about, what threaded the needle for Apple was user experience centered empathy, right? Apple is a company built on empathy. Johnny Ives, who was inspired by Dita Rams, whose birthday is today. And by today, I mean, May 20th, 2020. He was essentially the gardener that planted the tree, which would later bear the fruit of Apple, which would fall. And Johnny Ives himself has said that he's at it huge impact from Dita Rams. And Dita Rams is somebody that has been attributed as, and I don't mean this in a blasphemous way, but sort of like the Moses of design, design. Mm -hmm. coming up with the 10 principles of design and saying even that at last, these principles are meant to evolve and are meant to change. Mm -hmm. But all those principles he mentioned are still important. Good design is thorough. Good design is environmentally friendly. Good design is sustainable. You know, good design is it's design honest. that is honest. It neither tries to be what it is not, nor does it try to fulfill something that it know it cannot. Right? All these things are still relevant. And everything that weaves everything that he talked about was empathy. So <laughs> I think like, you know, to add to some of the, the answer to the question, the most important thing that I feel is necessary for any new entrepreneur, any, any human planning on being an entrepreneur, planning on creating, planning on utilizing is empathy. And the sooner that we submit to the will of it, the better that our world And just to wrap up the education portion before we take a break, I know that you're referencing a legacy that is multi-generational. You're planting seeds that you're not meant to harvest. Uh, that will be hundreds of years from now. How are you personally investing in the education of youth and people all around so that your mission and the greater narrative can be furthered? I'm a first generation Ghanaian immigrant kid, right? Who also had the duality of being raised with the Islamic influence. Mm. And I remember when I was a kid, I would learn all these different, you know, we call them hadiths or teachings. And one of them would talk about how you must invest in things beyond the physical realm to prepare yourself for your checking account that's not on this earth. Mm -hmm. So building schools where people can learn information, building wells where people can drink and feed themselves and all these things. So that's something that is very, very important to me. And specifically starting with places like Africa, where it's much easier to create because there's infrastructure as not existed. You know, when you come to the States and, you know, companies have just spent over two to three trillion dollars on 4G infrastructure. And now you want to talk about 6G. And they're like, well, we just finished doing this. It even just goes to show that we're misguided in optimization. We think everything is about optimization. I mean, we don't even understand that maybe if I put a hot pocket in the microwave and it takes 60 seconds, maybe I should just wait those 60 seconds. Maybe I should make a new microwave <laughs> that can do it in 10 seconds or five seconds. Well, this notion of optimization is leading us to our own detrimental demise. Mm -hmm. And so in that capacity, I'm focused on planting those seeds that I know that I won't reap. Uh, about a year and a half ago, I started focusing on real estate and thinking about how we can acquire you know, real estate to build these institutions. And so mm -hmm. I went back to Ghana. And at that time, I purchased 10 acres. Now that 10 has become 20. And by the ending of this year, it become 30 to 40 to really build a whole hub, an innovation hub for technology. And Ghana in particular is very interesting because the first president of Ghana, who's regarded, especially not in just Ghana, but Africa, as a very important person. And you mentioned Kofi Annan. Every person who respects this man is, Ko uh, is uh, Kwame Nkrumah, first mm. president of the Republic of Ghana. And he had built a school in Ghana before the country even gained its independence because he knew that education or freedom without education and documentation was not a freedom at all. Hmm. And so he built this institution called NUST, and it literally stands for the Kwame Nkrumah University of Science and Technology. Since then, not a lot of science and technology has emerged from the school because of limited resources, because of the scope in which people were exposed to. But that always stuck with me. He built a school before the country gained its own independence. Mm. And in that same capacity that Ghana, before you know the Portuguese and Europeans came in and changed a lot of things before colonialism, it used to be called Gold Coast, the land of the gold. And so I had this vision of making Ghana tech coast, the land of the tech. As somebody where people don't just say these are the physical finite resources that will one day deplete and when it's depleted we won't call it the land of the gold anymore how about we say this is the land of technology this is wakanda this is the land of 
the creation and supervision of technology. So to answer your question, I am very, very, very interested as well as committed to establishing sanctuaries of information. We have a page on Instagram called Exposure OS where we do our most to post as many books as possible. In the last year or so, we've posted more than a thousand books. And all of these books I've read, and now we're diversifying and allowing other people that are impactful to recommend books for themselves. But mm. exposure is very important and sowing those seeds in ways that the goal isn't even, it's not even in my mind that the seeds that we're sowing, you can mute somebody, you can execute somebody, you can whatever, but what you cannot destroy is vision. What you cannot destroy is the heirloom of education, the heirloom of exposure. I don't want to give people the physical heirloom of like, you know, this is our family. I'll save that for my family. But for humanity, we want to give them the heirloom of promise, the heirloom of access, and the heirloom of scaled information. Right? Mm. So it's so important. <laughs> and yes. we're actively doing a lot of things in the space to be a re reflection and representation of that. That's amazing to hear. The first guest I had on this podcast, Mariam Jem, is a Senegalese technologist. She's teaching amazing. a million women and girls how to code. And so if anyone's listening and they want to go reference that podcast to hear her story of how she went from being completely disempowered to now leading very powerfully hundreds and thousands and millions of people in empowering themselves to reposition Africa in the tech race. All right, we're going to put a pause here with Idris and jump to this week's mantras, then continue the rest of our conversation next week, where we dive into tricks of design, life skills we can learn from engineers, and winning insight, winsight, <laughs> on how he approaches the creative process and how we can set our value and walk in our power daily. So today I'm going to share a few takeaways and not all are pure affirmations. Some are merely reminders to get you to think, to invite you, to contemplate. I would love to hear your thoughts after you do that contemplation. So as always, I'll say each twice, then leave space for the third so you can repeat it aloud if you so desire. Here we go. First, the person who controls the diameter of my thinking controls the circumference of my knowledge. The person who controls the diameter of my thinking controls the circumference of my knowledge. Great, and second, this has two parts, so I'll pause between them when you are repeating. My body is a meticulously curated piece of technology. Answers for innovation and optimization can be found by going within and studying human and nature's design. My body is a meticulously curated piece of technology. Answers for innovation and optimization can be found by going within and studying human and nature's design. All right, follow me. My body is a meticulously curated piece of technology. Answers for innovation and optimization can be found by going within. and studying human and nature's design. Third, and I will break down this one too. My choices leave an heirloom of exposure to information, access to education, and the opportunity for new generations to scale. My choices leave an heirloom of exposure to information, access to education, and the opportunity for new generations to scale. Follow me. My choices leave an heirloom of exposure to information, access to education, and the opportunity for new generations to scale. 
wonderful. Remember, if you are altogether impressed or even intimidated by the dynamism of someone like Idris, recognize he is human. And as he stated, use his experience as a guide, not the North Star. Learn from his successes, improve upon his failures. You are a part of the solution, just like he is building his solutions. So none of us are exempt from you know bias and blind spots. That's why we get to collaborate. And I'm glad to be an ally in your transformation. And I can't wait to share more with you next week on Simplexity. It's anything but small talk, seriously. Peace.